Just going to be continuing back in the indwelling life teaching. This is going to be session 14. And um, living for God or living from God is the title of the session. Are you living for God or are you living from God? I'll explain what I mean by that as we get into it. But just if you haven't, if, you, if you're just new to this, this teaching, if you know, we're on session 14, so you can imagine we've covered quite a lot of ground. So you can get, you can get caught up on our website, our YouTube channel. Just want to encourage you to do that, but Romans chapter 5, verse 9, is, um, is this is kind of building off of what we looked at in last Sunday about justification by faith. It's also building off of what we looked at about three or four weeks ago about living from victory. Uh, that um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Paul is writing and he makes this statement, it's a very powerful statement. That much more than having now been justified by his blood, okay, we looked at that last Sunday, justification by faith comes when we receive the gift of imputed righteousness. It's the righteousness not of our own. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed to us and therefore reckoned as if we're just as righteous as Jesus Christ. And then when we receive that gift of imputed righteousness, God declares over us righteous and we're justified. Having now been justified by his blood, and this is by justification by faith, is by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. It's not by your obedience that you're justified. It is by grace alone, by faith alone. And Paul says that now having been justified by his blood, notice that this is a past event. It's in the past tense. It's a one-time event. Having now been justified by his blood through your faith in Jesus Christ, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That means, Paul's saying, justification by faith delivers you, saves you from the penalty of sin, which is hell. See, justification saves you from your sins and the penalty of your sins, which is hell. Now, we talked about that for two sessions. I'm not going to go through all that now, but so vitally important that we understand what justification by faith is. So important that the imputed righteousness of Christ declares you righteous and therefore saves you from the penalty of sin, which is hell. That is a one-time event in the past. Now, look at what he says in verse 10. For if while we were enemies... See, God did this when you were his enemy... What an incredible act of mercy and grace. When you're God's enemy, he justified you. And Paul's saying, while you were enemies, you were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This, this word saved here is not talking about saved from the penalty of sin. This is talking about saved from the power of sin, sanctification. That's that work in your body. See, one of the things, one of the problems that we have in the evangelical church, charismatic church, that's, that in this day and age is we, every time we see the word saved, we automatically by default shift into this mode where we think saved from hell, go to heaven. Saved from hell, go to heaven. So every time we see saved or salvation in the, in the New Testament, we automatically think, just we're hardwired this way, we automatically think saved and go to heaven when we die. But we've got to look at the context to see what exactly is the writer saying when he uses the word saved? I was thinking about this, just preparing for this message. I've shared this story before, but it was probably about seven years ago. And it, when we were putting Anna to bed, I guess she would have been seven. And we were putting her to bed and she, was, she had this back then, this prayer box. I've, I've told the story before, but she had this prayer box and she uh, emptied it out and would pray different things um, that was in that prayer box. And one, one night we were putting her to bed and she was like, Lord, I just pray that you would heal Donald Trump from his back, from being stabbed in the back. <laughs> and we're like, what? What do you, what? Where did that come from? Praying that he would be healed from stabbed in the back. And it hit me. I was like, oh, 
She just saw a, tablo a tabloid at like Walmart and saw like Donald Trump stabbed in the back. And she thought literally Donald Trump was stabbed in the back. And so she, re she, she thought that she took that literally and it made me think, okay, that's the kind of way we are when it comes to talking about save, salvation. You know, in this day and age, um, I got a 14-year-old daughter now and it's really, really fun to pick on her. And they like to use these, these, you know, common everyday words in a different way, like drip, you know. I don't know if you know what, you know, I mentioned this before, but drip. You know, when I was growing up, drip means you were just, you know, you got out of the shower and you're wet and there's like water coming off of you, you need a towel. But no, drip to them means like you look really cool the way you're dressed. So I'm definitely not drip. She tells me that all the time. They also use the word sick. I mean, when I was growing up, sick means you need to go to the doctor, take medicine, and, you know, you know, get some sleep and some rest, and hopefully you'll feel better. Sick to them means, like, you're really cool. So, anyway, my point is this, is, like, we've got to understand when we come to the scriptures that we understand what the author is intending to mean when he uses a certain word. And so, Paul, when he says... In verse 10, that while we were enemies, if we were reconciled to him, how much more will we, will we be saved by his life? He's not talking about saved from hell. He's talking about saved from the power of sin that is at work in your body. And how does that work? It works by his indwelling life. His indwelling life saves you from the power of sin that is at work in your body. This is called sanctification. And so here we have in Romans, and so for the past few weeks, we've been kind of going through Romans 3 through 5, talking about imputation and all that means. But now Paul is making this statement here in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He's actually introducing to us a transition he's about to make from talking about justification by faith to moving and talking about sanctification. Now, I was thinking about this. It would be this statement here in verse 10 is kind of like, you know, I write books, so I was thinking about it. This is the way I would say, I would say this, is I would say, okay, I'm going to talk about sanctification in the next three or four chapters, but before I talk about sanctification, let me say one last thing about justification and the gift of imputed righteousness, which is what Paul does for the remaining of chapter 5. But then from Romans 6, 7, and 8, Paul is talking about sanctification. Does that make sense? Paul's talking about sanctification, that we will be saved from, we will be saved by his life. Now, I want to show you this. Now, let's flip over to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 where Paul deals with the law and how the law came to expose his sin nature. The commandment came, and the commandment revealed to Paul the utter sinfulness of his flesh. And now listen to this. He says now in verse 24, this is really the same thing he's just said in Romans 5.10, but he's expanded upon his thought. As he said, wretched man that I am. We're going to get into this. Why did he say he was wretched? Because... The commandment came and says, you shall not covet. And Paul, Paul began to see, no, that actually stirs up because of sin that is at work in my body. It actually stirs up greater and greater amounts of sin. He says, wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from this body of death? Or who will, who will I think the New King James says, who will deliver me? Or you could say it as if Paul was saying in Romans 10, who will save me? From this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Now let's flip over to Romans 8 here. Verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He's not talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about the law of sin and death that is at work in your unredeemed body. What Paul is saying here is that not only am I justified, declared righteous, and will I escape the penalty of sin in Jesus Christ, but I am also being saved by his life from the power of sin that is at work in my body. Justification saves you from your sins, 
Sanctification saves you from your sin. The root. See, sanctification goes to the very root and says, I'm going to deal with the root of your sin. Which is sin at work still in your unredeemed body and sin at the, the self-life you want to live by, that I want to live by. That self-life, that is the power of sin. I want to do what I want to do and how I want it done. That works with that inherent sin in your body. I don't know why I keep punching my elbow. I don't know why I'm doing that, but maybe it's right here that I have this most sin. I don't know. But I don't know why I do half the stuff I do. But anyway, I won't go there. But I might say dumb things. Like, no, I'm just kidding. I might get off on a bunny trail here. But anyway, sin at work in your body. I don't even know where I was. The life of Jesus Christ, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, saves you from your sin. The sin in your body, self-life in your soul, that wants to live your own life the way you want to live, that works with the sin in your body so that you are in bondage to sin. And so that's really what, the, what, what Paul has in mind, and that's really going to be our focus here as we talk about. The, I'm going to do this session in over two parts because it's, it's fairly deep, but we're making a transition from justification to sanctification, and we're making a transition about imputed righteousness to actual righteousness. That, that comes by obedience. Obedience does not save you in the sense it does not justify you. Obedience saves you in the sense it sanctifies you. But obedience is critical and is vital to the, uh, to the abiding life. You cannot come to a saving, uh, saving relationship with Jesus Christ through your obedience. No, no, no amount of obedience can make you justified in the sight of God. No amount of obedience can give you a righteous status. But obedience is critical in your relationship with the Lord. If you disobey and you walk in, an, in a place of disobedience with the Lord, it will cut you off from that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's look at this in, in uh, John chapter 15, verse 10. John 15, where he talks about the abiding life. John 15 Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. That's conditional. Being in this relationship with the Lord, in this fellowship with the Lord, hinges upon your obedience. If you're walking in disobedience, if you're walking in sin that dramatically affects your relationship with the Lord. The Lord said, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. So obedience is vital. Obedience is absolutely vital that if we want to, if we want to be in this abiding relationship with Jesus, then obedience is absolutely critical. The abiding life hinges upon Obedience. Now, just to make it simple, Jesus' commandments would just be the New Testament. It would also be, like he said in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the moral law. But it's those commandments that he calls us to obedience to. And these commandments can include things like, you know, the call to love God, the call to love your neighbor as yourself, the the moral, the moral requirements for living in the new covenant. You know, like he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Not having anger, not having lust. The mission he's called you to fulfill. All that he's called you to do. Who he expects you to be. All the exhortations to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what Jesus has called you to obey. Now, here's what's interesting is we have made a transition from living under the law to living under grace. But a lot of times I hear Christians go, hallelujah, we're I'm so thankful we're not under that heavy bondage of the law and that, you know, that terrible yoke of the law that they lived under back then. It would have been so terrible. Now under grace, it's so much more easy. I'm like, have you read 
The Sermon on the Mount? I mean, have you read the Sermon on the Mount? That's like contradicts exactly what you said. Under the law, if you, you could get away with murder if you didn't commit the physical act of murder. In, under grace, Jesus says, if you, have, if you have hate in your heart, if you have anger in your heart, you are a murderer. Under the law, you could get away with not committing adultery by not committing the physical act. Under grace, Jesus says, if you even look at a woman to lust, then you have committed adultery in your heart. So this idea that the law was easier than living under grace is, ta- is absolutely false. Living under grace, the standard, the, the standard of God's commandments is not lowered in any way. Grace does not make obedience optional. Grace makes obedience possible. See, God does not lower the standard under grace God actually lifts up the standard, but he gives you the power that enables you to obey. That's called enabling grace, and it's by the indwelling Holy Spirit. So what we find is that under the law, moving from being under the law to being under grace does not mean obedience is now optional. It now means obedience is now possible from what God intended, which would be from the heart and thought, motive, and deed. God's intention under the law was never just to say, it's okay just to have behavior modification. It's just okay to go up here but not convict the act. Under grace, he he revealed his intention. Under grace, his intention has always been that you've got, obedience is all about not even wanting to do it in the first place. And that takes his grace, doesn't it? That takes his grace. That takes his grace to, to be able to obey God from the heart. Obey him from the heart uh, in thought, motive, and deed. Now, I, w- I want to just talk about, just for a second, the law contrasted with grace. And I'm, 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 I'm not going to, just, I'm just going to reference this here. Is Exodus 20, verse uh, 3 through 17, the Ten Commandments. We all know that. But I just want you to, I want you to pay attention here to the change of obedience from the law to under grace. Because under law, God said, you shall. Under grace, God says, I will. And there's a, I want you to see this. Listen to this. In the Ten Commandments, the Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make, no, your, make for yourself no idol. You shall not worship them or serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not murder. murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. See, what's happened under, what, under the law, all of the responsibility God placed upon his people who had this nature that was incapable of obeying God. I mean, yes, they could do it okay, but when it came down to the very heart, they had no ability in their heart because they they had inherent sin in them and they could not fully obey him from the heart. Now, if you notice the the, the you shalls, now let's look, I'm I'm gonna just summarize here. Jeremiah 31, 33, you can go back and read this later. Jeremiah 31, 33 and Ezekiel 36, 25 and 27. I want you to notice what God is doing under grace. God says, notice the transition from from you shall to when God says, I will. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their heart. I will be their God. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. Now, listen to this. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Notice that transition from under law was you shall, you shall, you shall. Under grace, God says, I will do 11 things for you before I tell you or give you the stipulation to obey me. Now, that doesn't mean we can make an excuse for obedience. That's not what he's saying. The Lord's saying, I am going to do everything in my power so that you can live in obedience. 
that's grace, incredible. <laughs> See, he gives you a new righteous status and says you're justified. He puts his spirit within you and he, he, he recreates your human spirit and makes your spirit righteous and holy in union with him. Not only that, he writes his law upon your heart. Not only that, he gives you enabling grace, the power of God by the Holy Spirit, the enabling grace of God, so that you can obey what he commands you to obey. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you now have the choice of whether you walk in obedience or disobedience. Under the law, it was almost impossible to fully obey God from the heart because of their sin nature. Now under grace, because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have a new spirit, we have that ability now to live in obedience. So that now, the only reason we're walking in sin and disobedience is now because we've made that choice. See, what this brings us to, under grace, is a change in the way we obey. And like I said last week, it's much better to live in guilt-based, fear-based obedience than in disobedience. But under grace, God wants to change the way you obey. Not out of behavior modification, not out of bodily restraint. Now, there, there's, there's places for that. But God wants to change the way you obey so that your obedience is now driven by faith. It's now driven by affection. You're not obeying for God's approval. You're not obeying for God's acceptance. You're not obeying for God's love. You're obeying from God's acceptance, from God's approval, and from God's love. A massive change. So God wants to change. See, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. A lot of people read that and say, okay, well, I'm going to obey him to prove that I actually love him. And the Lord's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm actually saying is, if you love me, you naturally will obey me. God wants to change the way we obey, fear-based, guilt-based, we've all done it, condemnation-based obedience that comes from trying to measure up to God's standard and his approval, to obeying from his righteousness and his justification and from his acceptance and from his love. We, we change the way we obey. Grace wants to change the way we obey, that we obey him out of this passionate love for him. We have affection-filled obedience. See, the question is, under grace, are you going to try to obey Jesus' commandments by living for God, or are you going to obey his commandments by living from God? I hear it all the time. We just need to live for God. Okay, living for God is better than not living for God. But I hear it all the time, we just need to live for God. And what that means is we stir up all this soulish energy to try to, with everything in our ability, we're going to go live for God. Now, again, that's better than not living for God. But the question is, are we going to live for God or are we going to live from God? And I believe that's, the, that's what Paul's getting at in Romans 6, 7, and 8, is are you going to try to... See, Paul tried to live for God, even, even, in his, even after his conversion. Paul tried to live for God and realized, I can't in my own strength and power obey what these commandments are telling me to obey in the law. I can't do it. All it does is it stirs up sin and confronts me to sin or confronts me of my sin nature and causes sin to actually increase. It was not until Paul realized that he was never meant to try to obey God in his own strength and power that he said, thanks be to God, who through Jesus Christ my Lord, he has set me free from the law of sin and death by a greater law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's like we talked about in one of the sessions, it's like the law of aerodynamics, aerodynamics. 
in, in the law of gravity. The law of gravity is you throw a ball up, it's going to come down. No matter what goes up, comes down, unless you have a greater law that overcomes it, the law of aerodynamics. That's the way it is with us. We have sin within our body, sin within our soul, come together as the flesh. We naturally sin. There is a law of sin and death. If we live in the flesh, we are going to sin, and it's going to create death. To overcome that law that is always there, like the law of gravity, we must have a greater law at work in us. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that you change the way, the life source you live from. No longer do you live from your own self-life. I want to do what I want to do, the way I want to do it, and how I want it done. You change it to say, Lord, you live in me, Jesus, that I would live by your life. And so this is all that to say, we've been going through, we're going through 10 different laws of the Spirit-led life. This is the fifth law of the Spirit-led life, is that living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. Living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. And so let's turn now to Romans chapter 7. Is this making sense? It's kind of a lot of information. See, some of you are processing. That's good. Romans 7. In Romans 7... 1 through 6, Paul is giving to us what our legal position is like. Basically, he's saying to us, you've died to the law in the body of Christ. You've been joined to Christ, spirit to spirit. So now you can bear fruit for God. Because the law, all the law, all, all the law does, verse 5, is while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Let me just say this one thing about the law because people get confused. Most of the time when Paul's talking about the law is he has in mind the moral commandments, the Ten Commandments. He does not typically, unless the context says it, have in mind the ceremonial laws, the civil laws, the dietary laws, so a lot of times Christians go, okay, this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me or apply to me. No, it actually makes a ton of sense because every one of the moral commandments of the law were carried over into the New Covenant, into the New Testament. Every one of the Ten Commandments, or nine of ten of them, not the Sabbath, nine of the Ten Commandments were carried in to the New Testament. So, so just by default, unless the context, when you see the law in, in the New Testament, if, unless it says like a reference to the ceremony or civil law, Paul has in mind the moral commandments. And, this, and the Jesus had the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. So, so when Paul's talking about the, the, the law, he means things like adultery. He means coveting and, and idolatry and, and things like that. I, um, and so just, just to make that clear, Paul says that these external commandments, these while we were in the flesh, these sinful passions which were aroused by these external commandments were at work on the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Now, when you get to verses 7 through, I would say, 13, there's a, actually from about 7, 7 to verse, all the way down to 25, there's a big debate among scholars. Is Paul impersonating someone? Is Paul trying to, you know, show what his, show what, you know, someone who's not saved is going through? And there's a big debate among scholars. I, I just believe from Romans, I'm going to go into all debate, but from Romans 7, verse 7 through 13, that Paul is describing his pre-conversion um, his pre-conversion experience with the law. In other words, there was a time when I didn't have the law, and the law came and said, you shall not covet. And then all of a sudden, that commandment, which was meant to produce life in me, actually killed me and brought death. And, and so I believe that's probably talking about Paul before he was saved. Now, but I believe in verses 14 through 25, 
Paul is giving his personal testimony of the struggle that he still has with sin. And, I, and that's, as we go through this, this passage, I want you to just think about what is it that you struggle with? You know, if, is it lust? Is it sexual sin? Is it pride? Is it anger? Is it judgment? Is it criticism? Is it jealousy? Is it envy? Is it selfishness? Is it what, you know, anger, bitterness, whatever? It could, it could be a million things. And you're probably like, yeah, I've got all those. Okay, I can understand that. You know, we all have these battles. But for Paul, his struggle was with coveting. Paul had this, this the law came, and the law came to him, and it says in, in verse it says here in verse uh, 13, I, I, I like this, what it, what it says here. In verse 13, if I never get there, that through the commandment, through the commandment you shall not covet, the sin that was in Paul became utterly sinful. In other words, what Paul is saying here is the commandment which was meant to produce life actually exposed to me how depraved I am. The law was, was meant to say, you shall not covet, actually stirred up in me, within me coveting of every kind, and it killed me. It produced death in me. And so the commandment revealed to me my incredible depravity. It showed me the utter depravity of my flesh. And so Paul had this encounter, but even, even after he was saved, because in, in 7, verses 7 through 13, you can look at it, it's in the past tense. But in verses 13 through 25, it's in the present tense. In other words, 7 through 13 is talking about before he was saved, most likely. 13 through 25 is talking about the current struggle that, or not when Paul was writing this, the, the struggle is his personal testimony of his battle with flesh. The things I want to do, I can't do. The law says, you know, we can just bring it into the New Testament. The, law, the, the New Testament says, don't covet, don't lust, don't have pride, don't have anger, don't have fear, don't have, you know, a million things. Don't be jealous, don't judge, whatever it is. All these commandments that God gives us, and we look at it and we go, the things I want to do, I can't do. I don't want to be in bondage to this sin that I have or these sins that I'm in bondage to. And what Paul is showing us in Romans chapter 7 is God wants to go at the root of this thing. He doesn't just want to deal with your sins. He wants to deal with your sin. The very root, the reason why you sin is because of sin in your body and selfishness self-life in your soul. And Paul was saying, I, God's going to the root of it. But sometimes God doesn't go to the root of it until the commandment comes and exposes to you the utter depravity of your flesh. And you cry out like Paul, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? See, having been justified by his blood, how much more will, will we be saved delivered from the body of this death by living from his life. And so Paul had to have this experience. Paul had to have this encounter with God's commandments that said, I simply can't do it. If you want that experience, just read the Sermon on the Mount. And you will realize how far you are from living to the standard God wants us to live. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. You know, get the, the, un, get the judgment out of your life, the criticism out of your life, the unrighteous judgment. Stop doing what you do so people will praise you and store treasures in heaven. Enter through the narrow gate. I mean, you just read that and you're like, I just want to say that is the standard that Jesus Christ is calling us to, the Sermon on the Mount. If you read that and you don't understand the power of God in you, you will come under incredible condemnation like, I can't do this. You're right. You can't. <laughs> Only he can. 
But he can in you and, and he will do it in you. So Paul had this experience where he, would, he realized my condition, I cannot get victory. I cannot experience deliverance. I, I'm trying to live for God. I'm trying to live for God. I'm trying to be obedient. And this is after he's saved. I'm trying to do all these things, but I just can't do it. The things I want to do, I can't do. I mean, how many of you have ever had that experience? Yeah, okay. Other ones that didn't raise your hand, pray for us who are struggling here. Because those things I want to do, I can't do. And Paul had this experience where the commandment says, it came and exposed the depravity of his flesh. See, there's nothing wrong with the law, for the law is holy, righteous, and good. But there's something terribly wrong with me and you and Paul and every person in Christ because of their sin nature, because of their flesh. Until they learn how, and we learn how, to live by the indwelling life of Christ, we are going to live by the flesh. That's why there's carnal Christians. That's why there is carnal Christians. Some people say, well, if they're really, if they're really saved, they would not be practicing carnality. That's false. The whole book of 1 Corinthians is written to carnal Christians. <laughs> so this idea that Christians can't do stuff, Paul even said there is a man in your church, and to the carnal Corinthians, there's a man in your church, he's having sexual relationships with his mother-in-law. It's worse than what Gentiles are doing. Paul said, I, I handed him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit would be saved on the day of Jesus Christ. That man living in that gross of perversion is, is in heaven today, based on what Paul said. There are carnal Christians. So some people say, well, if he was really born again, he wouldn't do that. How do we, I mean, God's the judge if they're born again or not. There are carnal Christians that live in carnality, that live in the sin nature, that live in the flesh. And Paul is telling us how to overcome that sin nature that we can, every one of us can live in that sin nature because it's, it hasn't fully been dealt with because we don't have resurrected bodies yet. And so Paul realizes this condition he's in. And this struggle he's in in Romans chapter 7. And this commandment comes to show him, and, and this coveting, how much I struggle with, with coveting. Now I want you to look at Romans chapter 7 verse 15. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. And I want you to notice as we go through this, how often... Paul says, I, me, myself. Okay, he says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I pra for the good that I, I want to, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I want you to catch this. Paul used the word I 18 times in those four, four or five verses, me four times, and my once, totaling 23 times where Paul focused upon himself. What did the commandment do? It focused Paul's attention from Jesus Christ to himself. And what he must do to be obedient. Did you catch that? The commandment came and Paul thought, I've got to obey this in my own strength and power. Even as a Christian, Paul didn't have this revelation. Paul's giving his testimony here. Even as a justified, born-again Christian, Paul is saying, I, I had this struggle. And the commandment came and says, you shall not covet it. But all that, what happened is Paul said... Paul's focus shifted from Jesus to himself and the absolute wretchedness of his condition. I mean, how many times has that ever happened to you? 
Don't lust. Don't have pride. Don't be jealous. Don't be envy, envious. Don't covet. Whatever it would be. And all of a sudden you find out that, this, you know, it's like that, that one thing that, you know, you're talking to somebody and this, this weird looking person walks by and they say, don't look at that person over there. The first thing you do is you look at this person. Like there's no way to even restrain that. It's like, you know, it's kind of like the commandment says, don't covet, don't, you know, don't do these things. And all of a sudden it actually stirs those things up because it gets your focus upon you and your ability to obey. You know, bring this into what one of our, our main focuses is, is here, is the bride making herself ready. Is yes, there is human responsibility involved in this. God has a part that we can't do. We have a part that God won't do. There is this, what theologians call synergism, this dual role, this part God has, this part you have. But if we focus on our responsibility and what we have to do and we get our focus off of Christ, then just like Paul, we will have the struggle to say, those things I want to do, I can't do. And it wasn't until Paul got to the end of himself and he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death that Paul realized Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. It wasn't his experience of salvation. It was experience or, you know, justification. It was his revelation that Jesus not only paid for his sins, but he paid for his sin. And he realized the indwelling life of Christ gives me the power to overcome these things I struggle with. And then he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, that, so that the law, the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us who do not walk after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. The requirements of God's commandments, whatever they are, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever God's requirements are, they are fulfilled. They are accomplished in those who are in Christ through obedience as we walk, not by the flesh. So you, you can even try in the flesh like Paul did. I'm trying to obey him. I'm trying to do what he's saying to do. I'm trying everything I can. And God, like a lifeguard, you know, a lifeguard says, you know, and, and when you're a lifeguard, one of the things you do as a lifeguard is you wait. You, the, they teach lifeguards. Okay, if you see someone drowning, wait until they've exhausted all of their energy trying to save themselves before you jump in and rescue them. Otherwise, if you don't do that, they're going to pull you in and you could drown as well. So the lifeguard waits until the person is, gives up all their energy and effort trying to save themselves and he comes in and rescues them. That's the way the Holy Spirit is, is he waits till you realize you can't do it. You can't do it. And you say, okay, I can no longer live the Christian life. I can no longer live up to God's expectation. I can no longer live up to his requirement and what he wants. I can no longer obey in the way he wants me to obey. Sometimes people just fall away because of that discouragement. And God's like, don't fall away. I'm actually leading you that way so you realize you can't do it, but I in you can. And so, so many times people have fallen away and become discouraged and quit and say it's too hard and they fall away because they didn't realize God was waiting for you to drown, to almost be to the place where you're about to drown so he can take you up out of that and be your savior, not just from your sins, but from the source of your sin, your flesh and yourself. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He has delivered you from that. Living for God or living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. We can never, ever in our own strength and power, obey at the depth and thought, motive, and deed the way God requires us to obey apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit doing it in you and through you by you living from his 
life. Desperation leads to life. And we'll talk about this next week, but even the Galatians, the Galatians were justified and all of a sudden they were trying to be perfected, they were trying to be sanctified by the works of the law, by them trying to obey God in their own strength. They were trying to live for God. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You started off really great. You started off by faith and reliance upon the Holy Spirit. But now you're trying to carry out your sanctification to completion in your own power, in your own strength. See, we cannot be justified by, our, by anything we do. It takes all of God. And it, when it comes to sanctification, we cannot be obedient to God in and of ourselves. It is a part God has and a part you have. And it has, we've got to, obedience to the Lord comes by living from his life. Let's go back now to Romans chapter chapter 7 here. Wretched man that I am. Sometimes I hear this in the church today that, you know, sometimes Christians shouldn't focus on that because of what Jesus has done for them. Justification by faith does not make you actually righteous. We talked about that. Sanctification makes you righteous. If Paul the Apostle said, I am a wretched man when I live by the flesh, we are wretched people if we live by the flesh. Who will set me free from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He will save us. How much more will He save us? By His life. He will. Now, verse chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's Paul's discovery. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in other words, what we've said in this whole class, indwelling life. Just, I'll just read it this way. Living by the indwelling life of Christ sets you free from the bondage of the flesh. Now let's look at verse four, uh, verse 4. So that the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us. God's standards and God's requirements do not, are not lowered. They are fulfilled in his people as we obey by the Spirit of God, by his enabling grace. So just to bring this to a close, are you living for God trying to do what God wants you to do in your own strength, trying to obey in your own strength, trying to overcome in your own strength? Or are you living from God, from his life that is in you? Living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. Amen. We'll, we'll pick up with uh, part two of this next Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Lord, this is deep. I'm asking you, Lord, to, to really unveil to us how deep this is. On the one hand, it's simple. On the other hand, it's deep. On the one hand, it's 
letting Christ live instead of you. But on the other hand, it goes so deep into us, Lord. Just this desire to want to do it all, all on our own without learning to live from you instead of trying to live, and we're trying to live for you. Lord, I'm asking you to bring about that change, that paradigm shift, Lord, in our thinking, that of what the Christian life is meant to be, that we died in the body of Christ to the law, and we were joined to you spirit to spirit so that we might bear fruit for God. I'm asking you, Lord, that there, I just pray right now, Lord, I just believe that people listening, they've had struggles with the flesh, just real, real struggles with the flesh for many, many years. They've even tried getting set free many different ways. But I'm asking you, Lord, to give them the revelation you gave Paul. How much more will they be saved, delivered by living from your life in them? And I pray, Father, that you might set many people free from their bondages, Lord, by learning how to live by your life, Lord. Let that discovery come, I pray. Wherever the struggle is, Lord, wherever the struggle is, that that light might shine so that we could become fully obedient, we pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. 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 We'll end the online portion. We'll pick up with this.